So welcome everyone. My name is Catherine Ainsworth. I'm the CEO of Pony Club Australia and welcome you from Australia or elsewhere that are tuning in tonight. This webinar will be recorded and we'll put it up on our YouTube channel afterwards. So our speaker tonight needs no introduction. Uh, for those of you in the Pony Club community, you will know Andrew as a board member of Pony Club Australia for six years from 2016 to 2022. And currently now from 2023, we're very happy to have Andrew as the patron of Pony Club Australia. Around the world and in Australia, Andrew is well known as um, the world leader in equitation science and the application of uh, learning theory and evidence-based principles to the training of horses and other animals. With the Pony Club Australia syllabus, we recognise that a good understanding of equitation science is very important for both rider safety and horse welfare. The topic of the webinar tonight comes to us because of comments that we receive about um, I have a strong horse, therefore I need a stronger bit, or I need some tack, or I'm having trouble, or I'm not confident. And so before we reach for um, stronger pieces of tack, then I think that we need to think about how we are going with our horse training and our understanding of the pathway and communication between horse and rider. So solutions for strong horses. Um, welcome, everyone, and I'll hand over to Andrew. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody, and thanks a lot, Catherine, for that introduction. Uh, instead of doing a, um, the usual PowerPoint type thing, I thought I would just make it um, much more personal and give some background to how I came to my, well, where I, my position is in equitation science, because I was very much a, um, a competitive horse rider in my early days. And just to uh, probably drill down to my very beginning of uh, in, with horses, my, my mother was a uh, pony club instructor at Long Worry Pony, which was Labatouche Pony Club in Victoria in those days. And we moved to King Island. And that was fantastic for me because uh, I was very interested in animals, um, not just horses, but all animals. So King Island is such a haven for all sorts of wildlife that it was fantastic. And there I got into a pony club team or a couple of teams uh, for the what we call the um, the state uh, trials, the horse trials championships. And um, on a pretty wild uh, horse that actually I thought needed a very strong bit and I certainly used one, um, his mother um, was a descendant from um, a, a, wild, a group of wild horses on the north of the island that legend says swam ashore from a shipwreck of uh, thoroughbreds going to Tasmania, to Hobart, in the 1800s. And the father was a, um, a pacer who, was, who managed to jump the fence, and hence my horse. And he was, really the he was actually the first one uh, tamed from that uh, group of Brumby mares. Anyway, um, he was a very nice horse. I really enjoyed him. His name was Saracen or Sam and um, a pretty ungainly sort of creature because he would um, half trot and half canter to jumps. But I ended up taking, when I went to Tasmania to uni, I took him down there with me and I had lessons from uh, Captain Harry Sanner, who's um, George's father down in Hobart. And, um, and this horse went from strength to strength in show jumping. And um, it, despite his pretty strange gait. But my heart was really in galloping. I loved venting, so I wanted to go further with that. And this horse wasn't really going to cut it for me um, because of the, the dressage. I could certainly have done a much better job by eons uh, in later years, but um, that's how it was. And um, I left it at that with him with show jumping. I got a um, much more appropriate sort of horse, but as it turned out, because of my hands, I still needed, in my opinion, a stronger bit. And this horse I took to Gawler a three-day event um, and um, continued on. And then as time went on, I, I had another horse that uh, was even better. And um, well, unfortunately, the other one died during a three-day event. This was a horse called Remus. And um, 
it was a jump that was outlawed uh, because of that experience. Uh, it was actually a, a jump where it was a straight rail with a ditch behind it, not in front of it, but a ditch behind it. So it was a bit of a trap and um, and a bitumen road with no sand on it, which wasn't compulsory in those days to have sand on the crossing and you've got studs. So the horse unfortunately broke his neck. Um, it was a pretty tragic thing and um, I really wanted to give up riding altogether, but um, all my friends got together and said, no, keep going. So I did. I had a very nice horse uh, called Woodmount Enterprise that went on to win the Gawler three-day event at advanced in 1989. But because of those experiences, and I had some money from the Institute of Sport, I really wanted to find out, uh, not just get good coaching, which I did get, and I really appreciated it, and it helped enormously. But I wanted to find out more about what goes on in the horse's mind when it comes to training. And so that was really the beginning of my exploration. And in order to do that, and also with the hope of getting to other teams, I moved to Victoria. And uh, so upstaked with the upstakes with the family, my at that stage, two children and, and my wife, Manuela and myself, we moved to Victoria and um, I embarked on a PhD. And during that time, I was still eventing and I was starting to understand because of my exploration into learning about what negative reinforcement really was about and how it's unavoidable and really universal when it comes to controlling horses, when you've got a bridle on and a bit in the mouth and you use your legs because it's all about pressure release. And that's really what we've emphasized very clearly in the syllabus or throughout all the levels in the new Pony Club syllabus. And it's a very important thing to dissect that because very good trainers and riders are typically excellent at negative reinforcement. But oftentimes, because they don't actually know what it is, in essence, that it's about the release of pressure that rewards a behavior. When you use pressure, it's about the, you know, when the behavior um, happens and you immediately remove the pressure. Because of that, many of them are unable to translate it into other facets of the horse's life. For example, loading on the trailer. And that's where I was very fortunate to have some very good interactions with Tom Roberts. Um, he had just passed away and with his wife when I was doing uh, workshops in, in Adelaide. And I would go there and watch the movies of Tom Roberts and uh, Pat Roberts would sit me down with a cup of tea and I'd watch these movies and they were just so revealing. And I thought I've really got to change the way I train horses to load in the trailer. And it was beginning to fit in this really broad picture of what negative reinforcement was. Of course, we add on to that uh, with positive reinforcement, um, which is the addition of something that the horse wants, like you know, food or uh, scratching at the base of the withers, which is uh, very convenient. And the more we do it, the more the horse appreciates it. But ne nevertheless, negative reinforcement is the fundamental principle behind all that we do with our reins and our legs and every other signal that we use, like our voice and our body position and our body posture and our weight are actually quite secondary. They're very important because they make it easy for us to deliver messages to the horse. You know, if we sit in the perfect way and we don't interfere with the horse's body, um, therefore, the signals we give through the, through the reins and legs become much clearer. And then the use of the seat as well and our body posture becomes part of those signals. We call them compound aids. And um, the way it's best achieved is by, first of all, really focusing, and especially in the early start of a horse's life, on how we use the pressure and leash of the reins and legs and so I spent many years before I started my PhD, I had one of the largest breaking in businesses in Tasmania. In fact, I think I was the largest for racehorses. And at one point I had a maximum of 14 horses that I was breaking in um, day after day. And I was still teaching a little bit at the university. So I had these two opposing worlds. I had the academic world, which in, where I was learning a lot about um, what training is and all about reinforcement and learning. And then I had the other world where I was really at the coalface breaking in young horses. And that got me to really clearly understand that how important it was that every horse breaker trains a horse to stop from bit pressure, 
through the removal of bit pressure. And many of them have come to me at places like Equitana and said to me, for example, Steve Jeffries said these exact words to me. He said, Andrew, you put into words what I do in practice. And that's how it is. Monty Roberts has said the same thing to me, that it's really about how well we use our, our reins and legs. We're focusing in this talk on the on strong bits. So um, I'll talk a bit more about the uh, use of the reins and the various uh, bits that uh, people use. But just that background gave me quite an understanding of the way we prioritise aspects of training, such as the use of the pressure release and how that must always be not only done in the early days, but actually kept polished throughout the horse's life. We, we've got to get away from this idea that the horse is just a willing to please animal and he loves us and therefore he'll do it. And I think most of us and probably the people who are, who are you know, in the same position, the same boat as me who are listening can see that logic. But many people do think that that's all there is to it and they trust that the horse will never do a thing wrong because he will look after you. But we have to remember that what a, what the horse is when he's a, a, um, a six-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old, he's basically a summary of his genetic tendencies, you know, his tendency to be sensitive or less sensitive, um, his tendency to run, his tendency to maybe um, be aggressive as a coping mechanism, whereas others won't be, his, his tendency to shut down and um, to become apathetic. So they're, they're the three coping mechanisms that we find in not only animals, but humans too. That is uh, escape, fighting or apathy. And those things are, are, are important and they serve as a basis. But on top of that is the horse's experiences. So as I mentioned with those ages, you know, six or 10 or 15 or 20, whatever it is, the horse is an accumulation of all the experiences he has ever had from the rider using the reins in a certain way. Um, sometimes racehorses, for example, have not an easy start because uh, they, they have a shift knee in their mouth, you know, a, a rearing bit, which is actually okay if it's used correctly, because then if it's used correctly, it's nev it never needs to be strong. But um, the way it's often used, and unfortunately, many racehorse buyers want to see a frisky horse. And so therefore, the horse is often leaning on the bit in hand at the yielding sale. So it's already got a, a, a poorer start. And then if people don't know what they're doing and they lean on the bit, the more we try and make the horse round with our hands by seesawing on the mouth or driving the horse into a strong hand, those sorts of techniques can also cause the horse to habituate to the rein, to the bit pressure. In other words, to become used to it and to tolerate it, just like we habituate to all sorts of things in our, in our lives. Um, so that's that's problem that uh, the horse can learn to habituate, and then it appears that we need stronger and stronger bits. And and that, as I mentioned, is the problem because it can easily be where it becomes a continuous escalation in the sorts of bits that we need to use. For example, um, it, we might go from a, a thicker snaffle in the start, but then a thinner snaffle, you know, um, a, a, a very thin snaffle, and then maybe to a curb bit or a bit with um, other th other aspects on internally that can cause more pain or a Dr. Bristol, or all those sorts of things that basically work on a pain continuum. Now, if we ride horses, we have to accept the fact that what we are doing is when we're training the horse is to make him uh, uncomfortable when we pull on the reins. It's part of the, a pain continuum. We, we, we can't deny that. But if we do it really well, and it, as soon as the horse shows any element of slowing, we immediately soften with the reins, the horse learns to do it. It's um, one of the great ways of understanding negative reinforcement came to me via Tom Roberts again, um, where he asked people, when you sit on a pin, why do you get off? And people would say, well, that's because it hurts. And he'd say, no, 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 you get off because it stops hurting. And that's really important to understand. 
the horse slows down because the, it, it, will, it stops hurting. He learns that if he slows down, that's the answer to the question. And so it's important that we do it right. So while I also understand that safety is an absolutely paramount thing, and sometimes we will need to use stronger bits for some horses, I think if we work through the training, we will find that there's less need um, as we go along and in good hands, there, there may be no need. I had an interesting experience with this because, and I thought I would weave this story in, um, it's on my Facebook site now because it just uh, coincidentally, I was asked to do a story about a horse I had called Woodmount Magic. And um, I trained him as a racehorse because he was owned by a racehorse owner and he came with a bunch of weanlings and jumped off the truck when I lived in Tasmania and he had the most extraordinary movement and I thought I really would like that horse but the owner said no you can't buy him he's he's bred in the purple this horse he's he's going to win the Melbourne Cup so I said well could I train him and he said well if you get a race trainer's license maybe so I went and got myself a um, owner trainer's license and well, I didn't win a race and um, it looked like it was all my fault and it's most likely that much of it was that um, I wasn't a particularly good trainer at that point with race horses. But this horse was really a stayer. And so the owner of the horse, he still maintained his ownership there. He suggested we try another trainer. So the horse went to Michael Trinder, who was a trainer I greatly respected, very nice man and a very nice trainer in northern Tasmania. And um, Michael had him for a few starts and said, look, this horse is really a stayer and there are no races for that kind of staying distance. And so I ended up getting the horse for the price of one breaker. One, I had to break in one horse and I got Woodmap Magic. And to cut a long story short, this was also coinciding when I was doing my studies about learning. And I, this horse went through his entire career in eventing in just a snaffle. Whereas all my previous horses, I had Pelhams and I had a gag on one horse, all those sorts of things, because my opinion was this is just, these are just really strong horses. They love their eventing. They're really keen to go. That kind of story, that narrative was part of my whole deal, my whole life. But with Woodmount Magic, it was different. I started in a much better way. I understood about negative reinforcement and, um, this horse, uh, he went to advanced in just 12 outings. He only left home 12 times and won his way right through to the top very fast here in Victoria because we'd moved across and he was a four-year-old when I uh, moved across. And um, he went on and uh, did very well in dressage as well. He was one of the first horses to achieve 80% in a dressage test in North northeast Victoria. And, um, and then a fellow at well, Tim Collins offered me money for him at Melbourne three day event. And I ended up sadly selling him for a, a big price that helped pay for my farm. So I got a hundred thousand for the horse. He was the first horse in Australia to reach six figures. First stallion sold to Europe, Australian trained stallion sold to Europe. And he was a full thoroughbred. Um, his grandfathers on both sides were the son of, uh, of, of Star Kingdom. And so this horse really, was my proving ground for understanding how things went. And from then on, I had other horses that people would give to me because when I sold him, I couldn't replace him. I, I couldn't find another horse. I didn't want one, want one worse, of course. So I was searching for a nice stallion and I, I, um, I didn't find one for a, a long time. And um, in the meantime, I had other horses and there was one that um, uh, Sharon Ridgway gave me called uh, Kill Dalton Castle that had bolted his way around three day events. He was New South Wales country race champion. And um, a couple of very experienced event riders had basically got off the horse at Melbourne three day event and one other three day event. And um, I was the lunatic who got to ride the horse. But as it turned out, um, I really enjoyed riding him. And he ended up going in a snaffle. And the way I did that was just to do lots and lots of downward transitions. So I would practice in a start box at home, I had a, a U-shaped bounce jump that I used as a start box. And I would do lots of transitions. And the moment he slowed it all, I would give. 
and he soon got the hang of it. And the thing is to do a lot of it. What I didn't do as much of in those days that I have since learned with other horses, because I became um, a bit of a specialist in this sort of horse, and I was running workshops in Europe from Finland all the way down to Switzerland um, for a period of around 15 years, as well as Canada and the US. And um, what I um, began to realize is there's so much you can do on the ground. Because if you realize that when you've got a bit in the horse's mouth and he's in hand, it's really important that when he leads, he leads in self-carriage. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have a contact. You can have a very light contact, just a, a, a you know a very light gossamer feel of his lips and tongue, which is ideal. Um, and the moment he increases pressure on that, then use the pressure back towards his chest and the instant he slows give. And these sorts of downward transitions can be done not only uh, you know in the, in the broadest way from uh, during walk to halt, but also for slowing. Um, and we can use different types of aids like a more brief aid for shortening the step as long as we go whoop and then give. And I think that's what people don't do enough of. And I've been to many situations where some of my pupils have asked me to help them and their coach has agreed for me to be there too. But one of the big faults that I see is people don't do enough downward transitions and all the top trainers in the world emphasize that you should. Kira Kirkland was one that was highly influential for me and my son worked for her for a number of years. And I think she, he would admit that she was the greatest influence on his, on his dressage career. And she would say it's really important to do lots and lots of transitions, uh, not only up the gate from your from when you're riding a horse from your legs, but also down the gate from your reins, and also in hand, stop and go faster, slower, ask the horse to trot, um, and ensure that from the forward motion of your hand that the horse does trot. If he doesn't, you can give him a, a tickle with the whip. And that doesn't mean whip him, that just means train him on the ground that when you go very lightly tapping, if you just keep the tapping going, the instant he goes forward, stop. So that very quickly the horse learns, any horse will learn it because none of them like the pressure. So they soon learn the answer to the question is to just go from the merest touch of the whip. And you should also be able to lay the whip across the horse's body and rub it over him with no effect on his mobility. It shouldn't make him afraid. It should make him move. It should be just be two taps in the end, two light taps are the signal for him to go forward. And the same with a rain aid. So we can teach him to do all of these transitions in hand um, of, of uh, forward and stop. Under saddle, it's the same thing. It's a very effective thing to train the horse to um, go from uh, a faster trot to a slower trot or from a trot to a walk um, or from a longer trot to a shorter trot. But as long as we make the period of time of the pressure, as long as it's the horse learns to respond to light pressure and to do that, we start off with a very light signal. Always we start off light and then increase it to the level that gives some kind of response and then release the pressure. And that's the sort of thing that is would be the answer for so many horses that apparently need strong bits. And I think that's so essential to do. Now, the other part, before I open this up for some more questions, is that it's frequently seen in jumping. And I get that um, as a jumping rider myself, uh, um, I realize that that's often what happens. But what we have to realize is ask our question, why does the horse accelerate to fences? Because that's a really dangerous thing to do. I don't think any parent should allow their children to ride a horse that where the horse just bolts towards a fence because when a horse does that, he lengthens his stride. They don't always, and they frequently mostly don't know um, if you leave it to themselves to just do it with a rider on top after many years of being ridden uh, inappropriately or badly. They don't know to necessarily go in a shorter canter on the way in. So they'll often hollow their back and flatten and therefore lengthen their stride, giving them no chance to, for a suitable takeoff. And if it's a 
fixed fence that can lead to a, a rotational fall. So it's a really important thing that we teach the horse that the jump itself is never a trigger for acceleration. So how does the horse learn it? Well, it starts, interestingly, not by approaching the fence. It starts by landing and running away. And that's often because of two reasons. One, that the horse uh, hits the fence and it hurts. So the horse's answer to most problems, being a prey animal, is to run away. Or it could be that the rider didn't ride appropriately and gave the horse a tug in the mouth. It didn't mean to, but it happened. And it, that's also pain, and that can make the horse run. And it doesn't take too many experiences like that where the horse begins to learn, aha, the obstacle itself, the jump, is a trigger for acceleration. So the way to train it is not to originally, or not to, in the beginning, train it by slowing the horse at the fence, because he probably won't if he's got that tendency very strongly, is to build a cross rail and then when the horse jumps the cross rail, ask the rider to just close the fingers on the reins, not pull on the mouth, not pull your arms back, but to close the fingers on the mouth and increase the pressure and see how many strides it takes the horse to halt. It ideally, over a cross rail, for most horses, it should be around about six metres that the horse can halt, but most take much more than that so that's why most horses will need this kind of training it's so useful and so when the coach does that and the horse jumps the cross rail and the rider knows because the coach has asked them to now close the as soon as you land close your fingers on the on the reins and see how long it takes for the horse to halt and if it takes 15 steps or strides um, how many canter strides, how many trot strides, the more you do it, the less it will take because the horse always learns it. He learns that he can stop earlier. If it's a really uh, persistent problem, it will of course take longer, but it's essential training to do. And I've done this all over the world. I've done it in Ireland with, I've done it with, uh, at a clinic with Kean O'Connor, the top show jumping guy there. It's very, very effective to do that. And then once you've done it over that one cross rail and the horse can halt, it might take quite a few repetitions or days of repetitions. When I say repetitions, don't do too many on one day, but then come back again and do it some other um, session later the next day, a few days after, and, um, and it will be reduced. And then when he's good at that and he can halt at six metres, then move the jump or build other jumps and check what it, can you do it with other kinds of obstacles not just that colored cross rail but other colors of cross rails and then what about a vertical a small vertical fence um, not too high because the higher it is you won't get six meters um, halt you'll need a lot more if it's a spread you'll need more than six meters you might you'll need eight to ten it doesn't matter but the important thing is that he answers the rain aids on landing and of course when the rider's got that and it's really very good that's the best moment to really improve that to make the finer adjustments of their position um, of course if their position's really in the road of success you've got to fix the position first but that's the job of a good coach and good coaches um, mostly know that but that's the thing is just to start to do it over other fences and trot to fences. Check that you can trot to a fence. Many people can't, but it's essential for eventing because if you can't trot to a fence, guaranteed that if you are an experienced event rider, you will know that every now and again, something goes a bit wrong and you find yourself trotting. It might be because of some boggy ground or something. And then the horse will say, I'm stopping because I haven't ever experienced jumping from a trot. It's really important that he can jump from a trot and once you can do that, then you can canter and just check you can do downward transitions at the canter. Of course, you'll never get them in six meters, but just check they're able to do it in a doable distance where you can see that on landing, the horse is definitely responding and there's no zone after the fence where the horse blocks out and says, 
I, I don't stop for a long time. I'll, I'll do it when I feel like it, so to speak. It's really important that when a rain aid is used and therefore the rider's position as well, those two things together, ultimately, that will give the horse some breaks. And that means when you come to uh, fences and you just sit up a little and raise your hands, the horse will get a little bit more bouncy and get a good stride and keep the rider safe. So that's really for me, um, they're simple things, but they're really ultimate and people don't do enough downward transitions um, or upward transitions. Often the schooling session is just endlessly trotting and trotting um, with no real alteration. And then yet the real learning ground for horses about the aids is the transition. It, it's the transitions that teach the horse all of the breaks. It's not actually just trotting um, around in circles or cantering around in circles. It's really important that downward transitions work and upward transitions work in the same way that you wouldn't get into a vehicle with no brakes. So I think that's probably um, in a nutshell uh, for me. So I'm happy to take to take questions. Thank you, Andrew. We have three questions that were submitted before the session. So we'll go through those first and then for others, if you would like to put a question in the chat window, we'll get through as many of those as we can as well. So um, first of all, Susan asked, I have a six-year-old gelding who seems to internalise his anxiety. I have had trouble reading his increased anxiety as he hides it very well until he explodes with a bolt, a buck or an escape. This has taken me by surprise twice and I do not feel confident riding him. I have been doing a lot of in-hand work, walking, etc., but at some stage I would like to ride him again. Any suggestions as to how to help him deal with his anxiety and how can I read him better? That's a great question because that leads to some areas that I haven't talked about. And I think when we talk about anxiety, we need to recognize that the horse has some very basic needs that as a horse uh, we need to allow for. And it's not always easy to see that. And that's also why we've included so much of this in the, in the new syllabus. And these are something that, are very well understood in, in the science of ethology, which is the science of animal behavior. And there are a number of them, but there are really um, four major things. Um, I'll get, I'll, training is one of them. That's the communication side. I'll get to that a little bit later because I've already talked about that um, to some extent. But we need also to think of the three Fs, and that is friends, foraging, and 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 um and freedom and i think um if i deal with friends first i think one thing that we fail to see frequently is that the horse is a social animal and it's so valuable to the horse to be with other horses there's mounting evidence now um that if the horse can not only not just know that other horses are nearby and not just see horses and not even to just sniff them through the bars, but if horses can actually touch each other and mutually groom, they are much happier. The more they are unable to do that, the more they become insecure because when basic needs aren't met, and that's, that's true for humans too, isolation is one of the biggest contributors to mental um, disorders in, in humans. When those basic needs like socialization are not met, various problems show up. For example, wind sucking and, and weaving and problems like that have a, a lot to do with a lack of socialization because those sorts of things are never seen in wild horses, in feral horses ever. Um, it's, so I think that's something that I grew up with not really understanding because, you know, I thought, well, I've got a nice horse, a nice bent horse, I've got a beautiful stable, got a fresh bedding, I look after that. Um, but my horses actually were out. Uh, we had two event horses at the time. My wife had one in the early days. They were together. But it is really important that they can touch each other and do some mutual grooming. 
a little for those who, many people have heard this but it's uh, an interesting story that i've been working with the manchester police and they have a very large mounted unit in england and i had been doing training workshops for a number of years and everything was getting better but they still said to me um jemima who was the head of the mounted police there she said um Look, everything's so much better, but there are still some horses that are shying and have trouble with uh, excavators and diggers and trams and God knows what on the road. And um, I said, well, there are, there are other things you can do, but it's, it, it will require a big change. And I said, for example, take down the bars between the stables. And um, of course, that was a problem. And it seemed like it. And I said, well, let's just do an experiment, take down the bars between two or three horses. And anyway, they had a meeting and they agreed, which was quite fantastic, to take down all the bars. And they did. And I said, please let me know if um, there are any problems, uh, because there will be in the first week, because we've done the same thing with elephants with exactly the same outcome. They're also social animals. And um, in the first week, if they've not had any social contact, there's a bit of cavorting in the stable and it also teaches you that horses as a sentient being also choose their mates they like to be near one horse but not near another so you can rearrange horses anyway that's what they did and everything quietened down and to their surprise horses that were afraid of trams and afraid of uh, bobcats and, and excavators that they would see on the side of the road were no longer afraid of them and that's because the horses were more secure so every good horseman needs to know this because it's absolutely essential for horses that we allow for their social behavior. And I know people think, well, it'll get a bite mark, you know, um, and that won't look good for the dressage judge. Well, the dressage judge needs to know that that's a happier horse than the one that's got the shiny coat that's isolated. So it's a very important thing that we allow for that. So that's the socialization aspect. The foraging aspect is also, that's another F. Um, that is not just about nutrition. It's actually about the need to forage, which is a strange thing for us to understand, but horses in nature forage for around 13 hours a day. That's what feral horses do. And um, that's a really important drive to just keep on munching and chewing. Now, it doesn't mean they've got to be ingesting so you can use slow feeders. It's just the act of doing it. You can use ball, you know, those balls you can buy um, for fun uh, to give the horse something to do for enrichment and put food in there where the horse moves it around his stable or yard or whatever. But giving the horse access to um, a slow feeder where he can just move his jaw and nibble um, will make a, a a really big improvement with that aspect of his mental insecurity, which can also lead to these out of behavior, out of um, the blue behaviors that um, Susan mentioned. And um, the the fact is, it's not just the uh, it's not just insecurity that shows up in training. It's also things like stereotypical behaviors, crib biting, as I mentioned, social lack of social um, contact can contribute to that, but so too, and very strongly, and there's good evidence for that from the Netherlands in research, Utrecht University, showing that um, horses that are group housed tend not to show stereotypical behaviours like creep biting and wind sucking and wood chewing. They just tend not to do it if they've got full time access to high fibre, low carb food such as hay. So. I've mentioned friends, um, foraging, and also the um, freedom to exercise. That's important. Now, that's probably not as critical in Australia because we have much more room and many of our horses, especially in Pony Club, um, have the benefit of that. It is a difficult one in countries that are snowbound like North America, Canada, and Finland and Sweden, um, where horses need to be stable and therefore, um, it's very important that they have some exercise. And that's when you release horses from being locked up. I think every horse person knows uh, that horses often leap and cavort. And, you know, we um, they show, as we say, joie de vivre. But what that really is, is it's called post-inhibitory rebound. 
And that occurs with any animal that's being confined and then suddenly liberated. They show a burst of energy. And um, it's not such a problem, but that's why they do it. But it t it's telling us that, um, that the exercise is a really important part of their lives. So they're those three Fs, the, the, the friends, the foraging and the freedom. And then the other one is the training, as I mentioned. I think one thing that might help Susan is that, you know, I was definitely in the same boat. I just saw problems. I didn't really delve deeply into them. But as I've done my workshops um, around the world, I started to, much of my work was with, I uh, almost always had horses at a high level. I worked with horses in Netherlands and England that were Grand Prix horses and, uh, and other countries too. And one of the things I always say to the audience, which, you know, it goes down like a lead balloon in the start, I would say, um, I'm a bit of a broken record because all I talk about is stop and go and turn and maybe yield the hindquarters a little bit, but really stop and go and turn. All behavior problems show up as deficits of stop and go and turn. So that's why we've mentioned in the syllabus the importance of testing these 10 basic responses. For example, um, in downward transitions, um, down gait, slower within the gate, so not necessarily down a gate, but just slower trot or slower walk from a faster walk. So down gate, slower, shorter. So that's not about slower steps, that's about short steps. Down gate, down gate slower, shorter, and step back. Test, you can do that. That's really important. That's not a rain back. It's just a simple single one step back that's big enough that causes the other step to come for free as well. And so they're, they're the four things from the reins, from the stop button that are really essential that we can do. And we can uh, do these transitions of down gates, slower, shorter in the fast, to, you know, up, up the gates as well and um, trot as well as walk and canter. And then from the go button, we have the opposites. We have up gate, faster within the gate and longer. And it really does make sense to the horse so it's important to check the, to ask the horse. It's really important to make, that it makes sense to the horse that he knows the different signals that we have from the leg aids and the rein aids for these various things of down gate slower, shorter, as well as up gate faster and longer. We need different types of aids, not just with the seat. That'll give him a hint, but it's a little bit of a quiz question. It's really important that it's really clear the aids that I teach people, but there are other possibilities, but the ones that I teach people is that if we close our fingers on the on the reins, um, that will be um, down a gate. So from walk to halt, for example, and we want it to happen within three steps of the front legs because any longer and he's leaning on the bit is not is, hasn't answered the question. So it's got to be a progressive slowing of tempo and stride length to halt. So we we do those uh, those things and then from the leg gauge we can uh, do the um, the opposite ones of going up the gate uh, faster and longer and when we've got those really very clear we also check that not only can we uh, turn the horse from a direct rein but also that we can close our outside rein even when we don't use the direct rein and we've trained the horse that when the rein comes to the neck he also turns in the same direction so that in the end, a turn can be just a shift of our hands and it becomes so, so small that no one notices. But that's actually what it's, it's uh, old classical dressage to be able to do that. But we also talk about use of the outside rein in dressage, for example, when we talk about inside leg to outside rein, but not many people know what the outside rein really does, but that's what it should do because the inside leg may uh, push the horse a little bit to the outside in the effort to get the horse more forward and the outside rein closes him on the line, on the circle, so he doesn't continually drift out and fall out. So it straightens the neck as well. So th those two things. And then the final one of, the, of number 10 is leg yield. And as I said, there are very few problems that arise in horses um, that are a result of lack of understanding about leg yield, except maybe pig rooting in the canter from the canter button. Everything else um, is to do with deficits of stop and go and turn. So whenever I have seen problem horses, 
that's whatever I go to. And I can honestly say that I've never seen a horse with a problem that doesn't have a mistake of down gate slower, shorter, step back, up gate faster, uh, longer, direct turn, indirect turn, or yield. I have never seen a horse that's perfect in all of those, yet still has a behavior problem. And so if we can attend to those aspects of training and teach him to be really clear about the reins and the legs, this is the ba these are the basics. That's what we should call the basics. His, what he knows about uh, negative reinforcement, which is an aspect of operant conditioning, because everything else that we do in terms of signals, like, um, as I mentioned, the use of the voice, the body posture, the weight aids, all of these are really classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning. They're about the horse learning to notice a signal that happens uh, just before and during the use of operant conditioning. So we, we need to recognize that we'll never stop a horse just from our seat, especially if a horse is bolting towards a freeway, we're all going to use our reins. If a horse is in, in a venting is veering to the left, we're going to open our right rein and get him back on track. Every event rider knows that. And um, it's really important that we do teach him those, those things. And our job of training is just to refine those things uh, throughout the horse's lifetime and to keep them polished every day. Thank you. Um, next from Tony on a different subject. Can you please give me some advice on how to get my six-year-old thoroughbred mare from pulling back every time she's tied? So she's tied with a piece of bailing twine on the post, which, which snaps, but um, it's annoying. So um, what can we do about a horse that constantly pulls back? Right, thank you. Well, that's a fantastic question because this is also, uh, again, as I mentioned, um, I'm a broken record. This is... Um, boils down to the horse's go response from the head collar. It's exactly the same thing as when a horse runs out of the horse float backwards because the, the handler usually has the lead rope in, in his or her hand and the horse feels the pressure on the head collar, which is normally the pressure for go forward because that's what you do when you train a horse in hand, you push your hand forward and the forward pressure, which is at the top of the head collar, is the signal for the horse to go forward. And when he does, you release the pressure and he learns that. Um, and so when the horse pulls back, he's really doing the opposite to the go aid. In other words, he's pulling on the go aid and quite often they will pull back, as most of you know, and they just eat grass. So in the end, the pulling back behavior just becomes something that he does in response to feeling light pressure on his head. And that's completely the opposite of what the horse should do when he feels light pressure on the top of the head collar. That should be the signal to step forward. And with the horse, that, and the same thing for the horse that pulls backwards or runs out of the out of the float backwards too fast. So we train the go button. Now, in order to do that, one way that we can do that is just with the head collar uh, on the horse and the lead rope in our hands, it's important that we always have gloves and we're you know um, kitted out for these sort this sort of work of retraining because the horse can pull back quite strongly. But it's a, useful to do this in an enclosed space and just stand at a forty five degree angle to the horse's shoulders and increase the pressure on the head collar. And every horse that pulls back always raises his head first and then he run, jumps backwards. And so as he increases his head pressure and if he goes backwards a bit, keep the pressure on just, just lightly. But the moment he steps towards you, give the pressure. Now, he probably already had learned that when he was broken in, but somewhere along the line, things went wrong. Now, that can happen inadvertently because a dog jumps out in the bushes, for example, and the horse pulls back and then discovers that the answer to head collar pressure on your head is to go backwards when it should always be to go forwards. So you, you do that and you keep doing this, uh, just smoothly increase the pressure, the horse steps forward, give. He only has to step one step. 
So don't ask for more because if you ask for more, that's like saying to the child that's learning maths, when you say to him, what's one plus one? And he says two, and you don't say, well done, you just keep asking more questions. So the answer becomes, uh, answering correctly becomes futile. And it's the same for the horse. So it's very important that we increase the pressure. He steps towards us, we give the pressure. And when he learns that, and we do that uh, to the front, and he soon learns to do it without lowering his head and we need or without raising his head. And we need to keep doing this until he does. Now, every time he gives a good response, like we should with every other um, response that I mentioned, when he gives the correct answer, then use positive reinforcement. Now, it doesn't matter if you use a, a clicker and food treat, or if you scratch him at the base of the neck and say, good boy. But I personally think that's really rewarding because it appeals to the social aspect of the horse. And there's increasing research that shows that it's so valuable to horses that we do scratch them at the base of the neck. Um, that, for example, the horse is the only horse, the only animal that we know of where the heart rate of the horse will lower by 10 beats per minute. That is, of course, if his heart rate is higher, not at baseline, that the low, heart rate will lower by 10 beats per minute when either humans or other horses scratch him at the base of the wither. Now, with horses that don't appear to like it, keep doing it till they do, because every horse is a social animal. And if they don't seem to like it, it's only because that's something very messed up in their early life. But you can rekindle that by scratching him until he looks at you and seems to be about to offer the same thing back to you, you know, some kind of uh, also affiliative kind of response. <clears throat> so then when he gives the right answer to the pressure forward, as soon as he steps forward, say, good boy, the instant he steps forward, it's a good boy, good girl, just good. And then whatever word you use, but that word should always mean, here comes something good, here comes a scratch. And if you always honor that commitment every time you say good, and that's what good trainers should be doing. It's so valuable to say, to mark the behavior that you wanted in the first place with a word and you say good, and then give him a scratch. And you, then you just keep repeating the pressure forward. Now, when you've done that, it's important to do it near the float, because if he's pulled back from the side of the float or wherever he does pull back, teach him to respond in the same way, because horses are very context, context specific animals and they're learning. That means their learning is very contextualized. So what they learn in one place, they don't necessarily translate it to other areas. They don't necessarily translate it to other people. Um, everything is so contextualized that it's really important to do it in at least five different places. That rule of five is quite an important one. And, um, and even with other people as well, teach children how to do it, that when the pressure slightly increases on the head collar, the horse's answer is nothing but step forward. And that will help a lot. The other thing that can be done is that if with a really persistent horse, is don't tie him up to something very solid because that hurts and that uh, hurts too much and it can break and then the problem gets worse. Tie him up, make sure it's high enough that he can't ever get his foot over it if that, if everything turns badly like that. But tie him to a car inner tube or a, um, a bicycle tube folded many times. I usually fold a car inner tube at least twice. And then if it pulls back, it feels just like a strong arm that he already learned in training because you pre-trained this with your own hand and he steps forward and learns to release the pressure in that way. But you can see this is such a good example of, again, how the basis of all good training is his answer to pressure release and the basis of all the problems we see mostly in training are dysfunctions of pressure release somewhere along the line things have gone wrong and that explains the naughty horse that explains the bad horse that explains the horse that everyone says is a bit of a pig or a bit of a this and they've labeled him but it's just a horse most likely in my experience that has learned to respond to pressure in the wrong way by going in the opposite direction so it's the same thing for stop that the strong horse often when he feels pressure goes faster he mustn't do that it's the way out of that is to teach him in hand and show him that as soon as he increases pressure, increase the pressure till he slows or steps back, depending what gate you're in. 
and release the pressure and just gradually retrain him. If you do this with pressure properly, you won't need to use strong aids. You won't need to pull. You won't need to tug or jerk or anything. That's a rarity. Um, that's something that's only ever needed for a really super difficult horses. And even then, there are better ways of doing it. So that coupled with, with positive reinforcement to help horses um, uh, learn more quickly it is really valuable. The, um, it, it helps accelerate their learning and it amplifies the release of pressure by using positive reinforcement as well. Uh, okay, and uh, next one. Could you please comment on how we can get better at detecting the presence of pain as a cause of behaviour rather than thinking it is a training issue requiring more or stronger equipment? Wow. Well, that's another great question because the um, pain is really interesting uh, question. In fact, um, and the way we can detect it is really rapidly increasing with technology. I gave a talk last year uh, for the Australian New Zealand Vet Veterinary Conference um, about detecting pain um, using particularly facial action coding, which in other words, facial signs of pain, because uh, there's increasing research that shows that. And it's true in dogs and even cats. Originally, this pain scale in the, on the face. I mean, there are other ways too, but I'll explain that in a minute. But these facial pain scales are really interesting because the face tells a lot. And um, originally this was done with mice. It was called the mouse grimace scale, if you can imagine that you can detect pain in a mouse, but you can. Um, and it, it shows up in wrinkles in the horses around the muzzle, um, the nostrils. Um, there are wrinkles around the nostril. There are wrinkles above the eye. The eye widens. Um, often you can see a bit more of the sclera, the, uh, the, the, um, the white of the eye. Uh, and the ears become a little bit further apart uh, than they were. It, it's really important and good um, observers of horses. Uh, I'm hoping we produce this in Pony Club because we've uh, got the, um, the these paint scales up, um, there. and. Um, it's as I said, it's a really increasing area of science, and now machine learning has really helped a lot, and it's developed uh, this coding system for facial pain called facial facial action coding systems, and um, it's for the first time last year not only um, negative affective states, in other words, sad states, can be shown on um, these machine learning uh, coding systems, but also um, positive affective states. In other words, happy states can be shown there too uh, with dogs. Um, we haven't, that hasn't been done with horses at the moment. We can just see negative affective states, which is um, alluding to the question about pain. But it is a really interesting area. This, this, this facial action coding systems, for those who are interested in the science of it, is dramatically increasing uh, as by the by the I could almost say by the week, and um, what it's possible for these machines to do is what well, like they do for facial recognition in humans, is they put, there are markers put all over the face, and then the horse is exposed to various um, things that are aversive, and you can see changes in the facial um, facial patterns, and so there will be machines that will be coming out for vets to be able to use and probably others too, um, that enable uh, pain to be seen. Because one of the problems of pain is that, and this is a, we, myself and a few other scientists wrote a paper on this um, last year um, about the use of pain detection in horses um, under saddle. Um, it's, it's valuable. And a, a vet in the UK, Sue Dyson, has done some really remarkable work looking at various aspects of pain, not just facial pain, but also in the body and aspects of the horse's gait. And it's really valuable. But the problem is, um, or there are a number of problems that make it difficult, is that chronic stress has the same markers as pain. 
they're, they're, it's impossible to distinguish the two apart, even if we look at parts of the brain, that the same six parts of the brain that show up in pain also show up in chronic stress. So if the horse is stressed because of its bad training, because for example, it leans on the bit and it um, uh, looks really tense and uh, anxious and keen, apparently keen to go and all that sort of thing, that shows up in the same way that pain does, which tells you how allied it is because pain itself is a stress response. So there are various ways of doing this. It's worth looking up um, pain scales, uh, facial action coding systems, um, and uh, the equine um, facial pain scale and equine grimace scale, all of those sorts of keywords can be used to, to look it up. And as I said, it's, um, it's in our syllabus too, I think at uh, B test level. Uh, at, uh, I think one thing I'd like to do is to see that everybody becomes a good observer of this because many times I've seen very, very experienced trainers to completely misunderstand that the that the horse is actually really stressed or in pain one of the two the two are difficult to distinguish that's why it's always important to get veterinary um, help I should have said that in the beginning but to assess whether the horse is actually in pain you know some musculoskeletal disorder get them uh, checked out with a vet if you suspect pain and if you don't if there's no pain then suspect stress and go back and really have a good hard look at training. In fact, I think have a good hard look at training anyway. And have a look at, you know, there's so many things we can do these days. There are people who, you know, fit saddles. When I was first eventing, you know, I had an all purpose saddle. We'd do dressage, cross country and show jumping in the one saddle. And then, hey presto, in the uh, late seventies and early eighties, we had a separate saddle for each and then along came saddle fitters and um, we used the same saddle for every horse and just packed it up a bit with a bit of saddle cloth or flock i'm sure many people remember that but nowadays we have saddle fitters that um, greatly help us and many people for example i know people like peter horriban um, also fit saddles very accurately to the horse's back and have really interesting ways of measuring the horse's back to get the ideal saddle fit because the horse can show back pain from an ill-fitting saddle girth there's more work done in girth and of course there are bit fitters that help us with fitting the bit and that's science in itself just looking at the different shapes of the horse's internal structure of its mouth some horses have have lower palates narrower palates narrower lower jaws um, and other aspects of uh, their uh, teeth arrangements as well so it's worth getting all of these checks, um, teeth, um, I think everything. There are so many corners of the star if we really do a good job rather than just bit, reaching for a, a bigger bit. I, I must say, um, as I said, that's what we would have done years ago. And, um, you know, we even had, I remember having, having horses in my team when I was on King Island uh, in a... Um, a, a, a very uh, severe, um, I can't remember the name of the bit anymore, but anyway, like a pelham, but a fixed um, a fixed bit um, with a chain underneath. And I think it's important to remember that the shanks on a pelham bit or a double bridle, anything with a curb, the normal curb length amplifies the pain in the horse's mouth, so what he feels by six times. Um, and because as it pulls onto the horse's lower jaw, the chain squashes the jaw and the tongue. And so a lot of damage can be done there. It can cut the, if the tongue's sitting on the mandibles um, of the lower jaw, it can cut the tongue on the corners. So it's very important, I think, and more important, having understood that, that we actually train the horse's basics of all of these transitions and really understand the primacy of training the horse to stop properly and to slow. And that when we release the pressure, as we're going in any gait, if we gave the rein away for two strides and retake the pressure, you know, the contact, not the pressure, but just whatever pressure that contact is, I think it's a, a couple of hundred grams about that. So when we take back the light aid, um, the horse is not increasing the pressure, um, hasn't, in, sorry, hasn't increased his speed 
when we've given the reins away. Um, not only hasn't increased his speed, but also hasn't changed anything, hasn't changed his outline, hasn't changed his straightness, his line. Um, and if we take our legs away even, he doesn't slow down. That's what self-carriage is. It's an ancient concept and it's one that's been really heavily um, destroyed by modern understandings in dressage where people use phrases like self-carriage but um, blur it and make it really opaque and difficult for the average person to understand. But basically self-carriage is if you've trained a bird to sit on your arm, you've got to let go of its wings to prove that it's trained to sit on your arm. If you've trained a horse to go forward and to go at a certain speed, give your reins away for a couple of strides and check. Give one rein away for a stride. And if he, lo if he veers sideways, he's telling you that he was actually held on his line by your reins. If you give the other rein away and he veers the other way, he's telling you he was held by that rein. And as I said, give both away. Take your legs away. Check all those things. And if you can do those tests, you have a safe horse. Okay, changing tack. Um, Emily asks, is head shaking and tossing something that can be overcome with pressure release training or is it neurological? It, it, oh, that's a good question. It's, it's really both um, because <clears throat> sometimes it's a, a neurological condition. It's a sort of idiopathic problem that can be um, sorted out with veterinary treatment. And in other cases, it's a response to bad, to moving hands. And it is very hard to ride a horse and learn to use your hands well. I mean, horses are amazing what they put up with uh, when we're learning. And so it is a very important thing to learn that we move our hands with the horse as he walks and as he canters, and our hands are really nice and still when he trots. Um, if we make mistakes in that, um, the horse can learn to flip the reins forward out of our hands and if he learns to do that persistently, he can become a head tosser. So he can learn um, through uh, the misuse of the reins and it can also, it can be an idiopathic thing that can be like an allergic response or some other response like that. So um, there are two possibilities there. Uh, okay, we'll need to flick through some of these. Uh, Louise, um, I have a nine-year-old child who has a very forward pony currently working on lots of downward transitions from trot to walk and walk to halt to improve the brakes. It's been hard for her to do the release as quickly as it would be ideal. How do you have any recommendations for how to accomplish that with a nine-year-old to improve their timing? Yes, I think that's a really another good question because that's the sort of thing that can be done in theory classes as well is to um, teach children to have good timing. You know, for example, if you drop a ball onto a desk, um, get everyone to clap the moment that, they, that the ball hits the desk. And it's quite surprising, um, even with my, some of my university classes when I used to do that, some people clap just a little bit later. And it is so important to be on time. So there are lots of ways of doing that, um, practicing um, with the bridle or with um, rubber reins, you know, you can buy those flexi band things. They're, they're really um, helpful when you're not on the horse so that you can learn to release, you can go pressure and give. And um, there are lots of exercises that uh, good coaches can think of that, to help do that. But um, I think probably uh, with children, the best way to teach them when they're on the horse is to do full transitions down a gate, not just within the gate, because often they are not perceptive enough. I mean, sometimes they are, but frequently they're not perceptive enough to know that the horse has slowed within the gate. So, for example, you're walking and the horses were going faster, but the horse, the rider might not be perceptive enough to, to know that the horse has slowed or has shortened, whichever one you want. Usually with children, we don't teach them the difference between slowing and shortening, but that's later on in their life. But nonetheless, if they do want shortening and slowing together, um, they can go woo and then give. But full transitions like trot to walk, walk to halt, um, halt to step back, they're really handy for to help, help children learn timing as well under saddle. Another one for the youngsters. I'm nine years old. 
I have a 21 year old pony who's very experienced. She's very smart. She knows I'm not strong enough. So she wants to run away. Um, we've had lots of lessons when teenagers or adults ride her. She knows they're strong enough, but I want to be able to ride her and I don't know how to stop her from running away. That's a good question too. I think um, it, again, doing lots of transitions at home and again, I emphasize that we don't do enough. Um, we need to do hundreds and that's a, so with a horse, it's a bit strong. That's one thing I didn't mention there is that I'm not only be able to do halt to walk um, in, in say within three beats of the front leg. So you can count the, because it's easy for children to count or anyone, but you, you know, the moment you begin, you're going at, you know, say right front leg, you're going one, two, three is the finish of the, the horse should be halted by the time the third leg has finished moving. But not only to do that, but also if the horse is strong, do bigger transitions. In other words, shout it a bit louder by doing transitions from trot to halt. And if, if we do that, horses can also do that in three, maybe four steps of the front legs. And um, if the horse is strong, it'll tend to do it in maybe six. So counting the number of steps, because periods of leaning, when the horse, when the rider asks the horse to slow down by squeezing the reins, um, if the horse is habituated to the bit pressure, the horse will frequently just, as if he's saying, no, wait, I'm not doing it right now, I'll do it later. And that's the horse that's at risk for running away. So I'm really glad that, uh, that you asked that question and you're nine years of age and you're very smart to ask that because do lots of transitions and do them in hand too. So run your pony along a fence line and then ask the pony uh, when you're at walk, say halt and have a quick look and see how many steps of the front legs it takes for the pony to stop and no more than three. And if it takes more than three, just keep repeating it till it takes three because the horses learn to reduce the pressure they're built. They already know about negative reinforcement like we do too. You know, we always um, learn how to avoid pressure when we're, or pain or discomfort. So when we are too hot, we put a coat on, that's negative reinforcement because we're removing that, that discomfort by our own actions. So do that in hand and then also maybe if he's good at that then say let's trot now and trot him along in there and you can use a voice command but say and woo and use the reins and count the front legs and just check it doesn't take longer than four steps and if it does keep repeating it and by doing bigger transitions and this is true under saddle too um, trot to halt that really goes deeply into training the horse the brakes it's better than just walk to halt because it it, it, you know, it shouts a bit louder within the gate and with a little bit more adrenaline in the horse because adrenaline makes the heart go faster and therefore, and adrenaline's a little bit of an analgesic too, so he doesn't quite feel the pressure as much as he did at earlier at lower speeds. So it just takes a little, a few more ounces of pressure maybe to get that response, but as he gets better at it, it comes lighter. Uh, thank you. The other one, the other um, Thanks, side Ned. of the coin. <laughs> <laughs> um, from, sorry, Emily. I have a horse that's very dull off the leg, especially in a walk to trot transition. Any techniques on um, retraining this as opposed to increasing the ass by kicking or using a whip? Um, also reflects on the ground. He's very dull when I ask him to go from a trot from the ground. Yes, there's some really good techniques that you can use. And that is, you see, if the horse has got a, a basic problem of um, being dull to go or too strong to stop, it's the same thing. Therefore, it's better to go to full transitions in gait rather than just slowing within the gait or quickening within the gait. So in other words, with this um, horse, don't just um, every time he slows down, give him a bit of a kick to keep him at his speed. Do this instead. Every time he seems to slow, trot. So walk him and as soon as in the walk he starts to slow down of his own accord, then squeeze and say, now trot. And if you keep doing those transitions where he expects to trot every time he's slowed, 
you'll soon learn to keep your speed. It's a really good technique and it means you don't need to use, um, you know, whipsaw in it or, or kicking because the moment you start helping them within the gate um, by, you know, keeping them going, then the next resort is spurs because the horse learns to habituate to the leg. But by the same token, it's very important, therefore, that good coaches or people have good coaching that where the rider doesn't continually kick with their legs or move their legs where the horse perceives it it's being asked to go but it's already going so the horse sees it as futile and he starts to slow down so having still legs in contact is an important aspect okay uh lily um i have a horse who's horse shy he's in a paddock with other horses 24 7 but he gets very worked up at competitions and explodes or dips behind the vertical. He doesn't do it at home. How can I get, help him through this? Do lots of transitions in hand and under saddle, as I mentioned, and um, and check also that, uh, well, he's already got some socialisation, so that's really good because that would have been one. Um, and I, he's in a paddock, so he's, he's obviously got foraging and he's obviously got exercise so I would actually just boil it down to something some hole in his training so you need to explore those 10 basic buttons that I mentioned that come from the reins and the legs which is again down gate slower within the gate shorter within the gate step back up up the gate faster within the gate longer within the gate direct turn indirect turn and finally leg yield and check all those basic things and you will see if he does that. I've never seen out of the blue random behavior with a horse that doesn't have deficits there and 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 that isn't in self-carriage. That's the problem um, it, these days is often there's no self-carriage that if we release the reins, even at top level, I you can clearly see that many horses if you let the reins go loose for two steps the horse will increase his speed and he shouldn't he should stay in the same speed so if the horse did do that you would immediately do a downward transition so no no releasing the reins is not a go button so you do a slow one a slowing aid and then give and test again um, and the other thing about if he short the horse shortens its neck and dips behind the vertical that's a real problem that's often caused by using the reins to get the horse to become rounder, where, you know, we just increase the pressure. So of course, the horse that increases, that experiences an increased pressure from the bit and and drops behind the bit and, and, and um, shortens the neck, that's actually a really big problem in hand as well as under saddle. So it's really important when we do transitions that we do them to the point where the horse doesn't shorten the neck at all and he stays with an open gullet. There's lots of interesting research on this um, to do with uh, the research into roll curve, into hyperflexion with you know short necks and behind the vertical that shows that horses with closed gullets have breathing issues up to 15% um, breathe air hunger, loss of, um, of, of breathing. It's like an asthma attack. So it's really important that we encourage riders to have horses to have an open gullet. It's not right to use animals in sport with uh, where they have these uh, problems like, um, you know, closing their neck and they and have breathing issues. And sometimes you can even hear it. But the way to fix that is when you do transitions, if the horse tends to close his neck first, which is an easier answer for horses often than slowing down, and they'll do it readily, is to just raise the hands a little bit so that the horse is less able to close his neck but just answers the slowing aid and as the horse gets better bring your hands back into a more normal position and in hand when you do slowing don't have the your hand in the normal position but run your hand back under his jaw for slowing so that he doesn't experience shortening of the neck shortening of the neck and confusing that with the stop button is a major problem so that's important to fix Okay, still on the necks and the heads. Um, from Felicity, what is the reason strong horses throw their heads to the stop aid, particularly in cross country? Again, it's, I mean, they don't do it when they decelerate in the, in the wild, so it's nothing to do with that. 
It's to do with something that we're doing. And that's what we have to assume. I think it's always better for trainers to turn the mirror on themselves because that actually provides a solution. If we say it's just the horse, there's no answer to that. You need to get another one, I suppose. And that's not a good answer. So we need to turn the mirror on ourselves and see that, you know, if the horse tosses his head, that's a mistake of release of pressure somewhere along the line. Again, I would go back to transitions and I'd even do them at the gallop and check that in the, when you're galloping, just far, not a flat out gallop, but just faster than a canter, that you can go woo and the horse immediately slows and then you give. If you hang on for too long, he'll flip. Some horses will quickly flip the reins out of your hands because he's telling you that you pulled for too long. That's that's why it's so critical to get across to people, all not only in Pony Club, but throughout the whole horse industry, especially racing, that um, it's the release of the pressure that trains. It's not the pressure itself. The pressure just motivates the horse to do something, but it's the release of the pressure that trains. Like Tom Roberts said, it's... it's um, you know, it's the okay. And uh, the, lastly, yeah. do you think there should be more awareness of what you're feeding and the effect that feed has on behavioural issues? Absolutely, I do. I think that's um, an, a really good question to finish off with. Um, there, are, there are quite a lot of studies now. Well, I, when I say quite a lot, I know of three um, that show that fat fibre diet diets um, produce less frisky explosive behavior than um, sugar carbohydrate diets do and so um, for that reason when i uh, ran the australian equine behavior center for many years when we had behavior problems we used to feed the horses copra now i'm not really such a great fan of copra anymore but it, it did serve that purpose because it's an oil product and um and so using oils and, um, and, and fat, and which is a fat, uh, and fibre um, really did make a difference. Uh, I think we definitely feed horses far too much sugar and carbohydrates. And many, many of the diets, you know, feeds that you can buy in the feed store have got far too much sugar and carbohydrate in them. So it's worth checking it out. And if you're really not racing horses and not galloping, you're not eventing at a high level, you really don't need to be zipping them up too much. I think that, um, and there, there are plenty of other um, diets uh, that are a, a good idea. For example, um, there are various oil-based diets um, that I, I'm a really quite a fan of. Um, there are also some big traps. There was one that came out where people talk about, well, rice doesn't make horses hot. And that's been going on for years. And of course it does. It's a carbohydrate like any other carbohydrate. Um, if you give horses too much in the way of carbs, um, it will um, start to have an effect. So yes, I think feeding is a really big thing to explore. And that's why, again, it's worth getting the assistance of nutritionists to um, give us some advice on that. Well, Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. And um, thank you, Andrew, very much. Um, best wishes for your forthcoming overseas trip. Thank you and, very much. Um, and we look forward to having another webinar uh, next month. So thank you very much, everyone.